Today we're moving on to an exciting period of groundbreaking environmental treaties being signed in the early 1970s. So we're going to look at the Ramsar Convention, the World Heritage Convention, CITES and a couple of others. So this is the fourth lecture in our story of unfolding the major, or unpacking the major international environmental treaties since 1945. So this is another important chapter. And just if you pause for a moment and think about where we were yesterday. So up until this point, there was very little. There's nothing like the modern system that we've got in place now. So by the end of the 60s, uh, it was a very different landscape in terms of the international regime that we currently have. So the treaties that we're considering in this lecture were groundbreaking at the time. They absolutely revolutionised the international framework for environmental protection when they were created. And they are still cornerstones of the modern international environmental legal system. So we're going to look at the Ramsar Convention, signed in 1971, the World Heritage Convention, signed in 1972, the Stockholm uh, Conference, not a convention, but just an important milestone in the development of international environmental policy and legal framework. Uh, CITES, uh, the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species, signed in 1973. The Bonn Convention, the Convention on Migratory Species, signed in 1979. I'm just going to mention the field trip at the end of this because it's relevant to World Heritage. Okay, so our context. Yesterday, in our previous lectures, we were looking at this period of 1945 to 1960, and there was very little, said there was very little concern relatively for the environment at that time. It was a period of post-World War II rebuilding. So if we move into the 1960s to the 1980s, just another broad period that I'm going to use for the purposes of our course to basically lay down some markers for what was happening at that time in the world. So let's summarise it as an ongoing period of rapid industrial and population growth in many parts of the world driven by major technological advances. So that's a continuation of what was happening in the previous period. But different to the previous period, government and public concern for environment emerges and there's groundbreaking environmental treaties negotiated. And the Cold War between the USA and the USSR continued, and in that period also the US was defeated in the Vietnam War. There's the threat of nuclear war was oppressive to the global community at this stage. And a milestone, a seminal work in terms of thinking about uh, environmental protection globally was this book by Rachel Carlson, written in 1962. And it's a wonderful book that captures the essence of its message in the title. So her basic message was that our indiscriminate use, or particularly she was looking at the US, the indiscriminate use of pesticides was effectively decimating the bird populations and that if we didn't change what we were doing, that we were going to soon wake up to a spring which was silent in that there was no bird song, no birds. So it captured a silent spring, sounds nice in a way, but it was actually a horrific title. So that book and its significance is hard to understate. This was a um, small uh, uh, article that was written uh, 50 years after the release of her book. Uh, the book is often credited with launching the modern environmental movement. We celebrate, uh, sorry, as we uh, celebrate vital regulations, uh, it's important to look back at how one book moved the US public to realise the importance of environmental protection and called the government to action. In Silent Spring, Rachel Carlson broke down four years of research on the harmful effects of DDT, a pesticide first used to kill malaria insects and later used to kill agricultural pests. And she looked at all the consequences, but particularly the famous chapter uh, in the book detailed a town in which DDT's effect had silenced all animals and residents. And yeah, it's a it, seminal work. In this period as well, there's also a number of major environmental disasters. Uh, the Turi Canyon uh, was a major oil spill in 1967. We're going to look at that again 
when we look at MARPOL, the marine pollution um, legislation in the next lecture. But briefly, it was a ship that ran aground southwest of uh, the United Kingdom and broke apart and its oil spilled through the uh, English Channel and, and heavily polluted the beaches of France. It was set alight, deliberately set alight, to burn off the oil. So this was the, the oil being burnt off. And uh, in this period, too, the 60s, you know, this is the first sort of um, colour imagery. So th this was uh, uh, pictures from uh, uh, Life, um, Time and Life magazine. So widely circulated and uh, really was a wake-up call to the European uh, and US uh, communities about the impacts that we we're having on the environment. So there was also strong domestic support for environmental protection in the 70s, uh, spurred by, and in the US uh, played a, a crucial global leadership role. So in a number of instances through this course, I'm critical of the US, I'm critical of Australia, I'm critical of a number of countries, but I also want to praise countries when they have done the right thing. And the US showed incredible leadership through this period in terms of environmental protection. And I just want to play you a little clip. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a little bit dated, but it captures some of the historic footage. And I think that's useful. Outside, and, and they realized the there was a time in this country when, you know, people went outside and, and they realized the air isn't as clean as it used to be. Water isn't drinkable everywhere. People used to be choking. People used to be getting sick and dying from the pollution in, in the cities back then. We had a problem with acid rain. The ozone layer was depleting because of chlorofluorocarbons. The bald eagle was threatened by the rampant use of DDT, a pesticide to thin the shells of eagles. Rivers that seemed to burn in the middle of the day because of the discharges children with mercury poison. But those were all consequences of an unregulated free-for-all. There was basically a broad public movement to clean it up. America sat down in the 1970s. They went out on the streets on Earth Day in record numbers, and they said, we need to fix this, and thus the EPA was born. The time has come for man to make his peace with nature. We must act, and act decisively. We have passed new laws to protect the environment, but there is much yet to be done. When it passed in 1970, there was one vote in all of the House and the Senate. It's incredible to think that the, environment, the US Environmental Protection Agency was actually created by the Republican Party, and the major laws in the US, national laws, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, and the like, um, were created by the Nixon administration with bipartisan support. That's just the antithesis of what the US situation is now, where there's no way that those laws could be enacted. So this is the context for these groundbreaking international environmental treaties to be negotiated. So the first one I want to unpack is the Convention on Wetlands of International Importance, especially as waterfowl habitat, signed in 1971. It's commonly called, obviously the title is a mouthful, it's commonly called the Ramsar Convention, and wetlands that are listed under it are called Ramsar Wetlands, and there's a Ramsar list. And that comes from the town where, or the city where it was signed, Ramsar in Iran. So in summary, the Ramsar Convention has currently 171 contracting parties, so nearly universal uh, agreement to it. So in the context where there's 193 odd countries in the world, so 171 contracting parties, 2,372 listed sites. Uh, the Conference of the Contracting Parties, that is the COP, meets every three years. And the Ramsar Secretariat is based in Switzerland and it manages the day-to-day -day activities of the convention. And it's got a great website, ramsar.org which has got packed full with really useful information and pictures. And if you're interested in doing Ramsar uh, in, for your research paper, you're definitely going to go and make great use of that website. 
So yeah, that's just a screen grab of the website as it currently is. Uh, as I said in our introductory lecture, these websites provide such a wealth of information on their uh, conventions. That's why you, you really don't need a textbook. The websites are far better resources where you can unpack and find a whole heap of documents and explanations about the different conventions. The main thing that uh, I'm hoping that you get from this course is that broader understanding of sort of where everything is and the big bits of it so that you know where to look. Because the problem with having so much information is it can drown you. Okay, so if we look at the Ramsar Convention, it had a preamble setting out the need to protect um, these wetlands and their importance. And then, as we saw with the Whaling Convention, and the typical way they start is to start with some, thanks Nivia, thank, to start with some uh, definitions. So Article 1, uh, for the purposes, purposes of this convention, wetlands are areas of marsh, fen, peat water, peatland or water, whether natural or artificial, permanent or temporary, with water that is static or flowing, fresh, brackish or salt, included, including areas of marine water, the depth of which at low tide does not exceed six metres. So there's a broad definition of, of what a wetland might be, or, or what a wetland is for the purposes of the convention. And then in Article 2, the obligation is imposed upon each contracting party shall designate suitable wetlands within its territory for inclusion in a list of wetlands of international importance, here and after referred to as the list, which is maintained by the Bureau established under Article 8. The boundaries of each wetland shall be precisely described and also delim delimited on a map and they may incorporate riparian, that is rivers and creeks, and coastal zones adjacent to the wetlands and islands or bodies of marine water deeper than six metres at low tide lying within the wetlands, especially where these have importance as waterfowl habitat. And wetlands should be selected for the list on account of their international significance in terms of ecology, botany, zoology, limnology or hydrology. In the first instance, wetlands of international importance to waterfowl at any season should be included. Okay, so we've talked about interpreting international treaties and this is a, just a good example of like a, it's a broad obligation to designate suitable wetlands um, and that they'll be included on the list and you've got to delineate their boundaries so it's quite clear uh, there's no hidden tricks in it it's not like that earlier convention we looked at with article 4 of the Antarctic Treaty that was deliberately obscure that is very rare generally uh, treaties are written to be clear so that they're easy to interpret it sorry, interpret in multiple languages. Uh, often treaties like this, they start and give broad obligations and those things are then fleshed out in later documents, later agreements and resolutions at the conferences of the parties. Article three then goes on to say, the contracting parties shall formulate and implement their planning so as to promote the conservation of wetlands included in the list and as far as possible, the wise use of wetlands in their territory. Uh, and each contracting party shall be arranged to be informed at the earliest possible time if the ecological character of any wetland in its territory and included in the list has changed, is changing or is likely to change as a result of development or pollution. So a couple of key terms there. Let's just talk about these articles. Who's the obligation imposed upon? Yep. Yep. Is it a strong obligation? Like who gets to decide which wetlands go on the list? The country. So it's one of the really important features of these uh, treaties and one of the reasons why they're so popular is that they still leave the management of the country to the sovereign government of that area. So the sovereign government still is in charge of what is listed under this convention. There's a, sure, there's an obligation upon it to identify suitable wetlands, but really that obligation is for it, primarily. And that's one of the, and we'll see with the World Heritage Convention as well, the same idea that the primary responsibility, the primary um, power to identify properties still lies with the contracting party. So, even though they've signed up to the convention, 
It's not that they've given up control of their territory to some international body or to other countries. So Article 3, what do you think are some key terms in Article 3? Say Article 3, Paragraph 1. The contracting parties shall formulate and implement their planning so as to promote the conservation of the wetlands included in the list and as far as possible the wise use of the wetlands in their territory. Wise use. So wise use is this key term that's used in Ramsar uh, and we'll see it gets fleshed out in later uh, agreements and later um, handbooks uh, and resolutions of the parties. So uh, these core terms that are stated in the um, treaty, the details get fleshed out later. Oh, sorry, and the other important term in paragraph two is ecological character. So wise use and ecological character are two of the key terms that are used in r sort of Ramsar planning and Ramsar um, yeah, obligations. Okay, so let's look at some examples because these, these areas are amazing. So let's, let's look at a few examples. This is a picture of the May Po Marshes Ramsar wetland in China. It's in this picture, there's a great egret, uh, the big white bird. And then the little ones that are flying, the flock that's flying across are marsh sandpipers. So marsh sandpipers breed in Eastern Europe, Southern Siberia and Northern China, and then move southwards from Africa and across Southern Asia to Australia. It's a summer migrant to Australia from August to April. So they're here now. The distance the marsh sandpipers fly from the May Po Marshes Ramsar wetland in China to if they came here to Moreton Bay, so Moreton Bay, on our doorstep of Brisbane is a listed Ramsar wetland. If they flew direct, they would go 7,000 kilometres. So that little bird, <laughs> hardly any bigger than your hand, flies 7,000 kilometres to, uh, to arrive in Moreton Bay. And obviously along the way, uh, if it stops, it needs to be able to you know, stop and refuel and uh, if wetlands are knocked out along the way by development, uh, we can lose, it's one of the huge challenges of migratory species is if, they, if you break a link in their migratory route, then you might lose the entire species. And there's an obvious, see the obvious need for international cooperation uh, to manage these species, uh, which no one wants to lose, uh, but we need to cooperate because they don't just stay in the one country. So, if we focus in on China uh, and Hong Kong, so uh, focusing in on Hong Kong, very much in the news uh, at the moment. Uh, and if you see that yellow line uh, running just here, so as you know, Hong Kong was a British territory uh, until, was it 1999 that it was handed back to China? Or 98? I can't remember which was the exact date, but it was handed back to China and now is a uh, semi a special governance region of China and having uh, considerable uh, problems at the moment with, um, I don't know what the right way to describe it is, the um, democracy, democracy movement um, within Hong Kong and the, uh, yeah, the concerns that that has for this, the central Chinese government. So, the yellow line uh, is basically was the border between China and the British territory and Shenzhen, a um, massive city, uh, is located on the northern side of that bay and you can see that yellow line there. So notice that everything uh, north of the yellow line is all developed and everything south, uh, well, to a point, is relatively um, natural. I presume that that's an artefact of the fact that it was a British territory and they kept that area undeveloped <clears throat> as a bit of a buffer from China and China developed basically right to the border of the British territory. <clears throat> Obviously it could go further now but the you know often we see artificial 
um, borders like that that are just the, an artifact of history and what was developed and when. And you can see in the northern part of that bay where Shenzhen is, obviously that coastline has been massively modified. It's obvious that there's been a large amount of land reclamation for the port there. So what would have been wetland areas similar to what you see in the east and southeast of the bay would have extended all the way around the bay and now they've all been filled in for uh, land, rec rec land reclamation. And that's the classic problem or reason why we are losing so much uh, of our coastal wetlands is because we're reclaiming it, developing it, draining areas for housing or industrial development or filling it in like this for a major city and a major port. So if you go down, uh, if you go into Google Earth, and this is what I did, so let's just say you were for your research paper, you wanted to do um, the Maypo Marshes wetland. Uh, there's no problem. You don't actually have to go there for a site visit. It's fine to go onto Google Earth, go down, find some relevant pictures, you know, pull them out, and you can put them in your uh, research paper. Just credit them to, you know, where they came from, who took them, but you don't have to physically go there. So something like this, in, in terms of a case study, you know, you can easily build up a case study with some good images like this. So if we're looking at that and we were thinking about the effectiveness of the management of this area for migratory birds, does this look good? Like looking at it visually, is there any visible pollution? No. You know, if you were a migratory wader bird that liked swimming around and going for, you know, digging around in the mud for things, does, would this look like a pretty attractive spot for you to land and have a swim? Yep, there's, so there's no visible pollution, there's no, you know, no obvious development in this image, um, yeah, no obvious things that make it anything other than a great spot for wader birds. So if you were looking at an image like this, that's in, say, for your research paper, that's actually a, a good example of saying, well, this is, is uh, at least some elements of the management of this area are effective through its planning in that that area hasn't been developed and still retains uh, important uh, ecological character for migratory birds. Uh, so here's just another picture from Google Earth. Again, no visible pollution, looks pretty good. If I was a migratory bird, that would be a great place to you know, rest my wings. Um, here we've got um, uh, an egret. Uh, again, no visible pollution, um, low tide out, and a lot of um, yeah, birds there pecking around in the mud, and the egret there. Okay, so we can look across the water. Again, on just from Google Earth, you can see Shenzhen in the distance. Is anyone from Shenzhen, by the way? No, we've got many students from China. No. Nope. Uh, so here's a picture of Shenzhen, and I. I put this image up in our first lecture. You can see the insert in the top right-hand corner. That's Shenzhen in 1980. And you can see the coastal margin was relatively undeveloped. It was a lot of rice paddies and the like. Uh, and then since really the 90s, it's been incredibly rapidly developed into a, a now a massive city and a massive um, industrial area and port. OK, so you can go onto the Ramsau site and look at the listing for the Maypo marshes and um, this I've just extracted it. Uh, it was first designated as a Ramsar site by the United Kingdom, transferred to China in 1997, so 97 not 90, I was wrong with 98 or 99. So first uh, designated by the United Kingdom and um, it's a shallow coastal bay with extensive intertidal mudflats backed by dwarf mangroves, shrimp and fish ponds. 13 globally threatened species of birds and 17 species of invertebrates, new to science, are present. An important area for international important numbers of wintering and migratory birds. The site regularly holds over 1% of the global population of at least three species of birds. Um, yep. Okay, so there's ongoing threats uh, to not just the Maypo marshes, but, but coastal areas throughout the world, including in Southeast Asia. So this was a report uh, from a couple of years ago, flying for their lives. In the 10 years leading to 2013, seawolves have destroyed 1.36 million hectares of intertidal habitat in China. 51% of China's coastal wetlands have now been lost, and the numbers are similar elsewhere. 
On the other side of the sea, South Korea has lost 60%. So ongoing, rapid, massive development of these coastal areas. And I'd emphasize this is all since the Ramsar Convention was signed. And you know these countries are parties to the Ramsar Convention. So if we're thinking about the effectiveness of the Ramsar Convention, do you think it's effective or ineffective? in terms of achieving protection of these wetland areas. It doesn't seem very effective, does it? And I must admit, I gave you a false choice there because one of the th key things I'm gonna emphasize in terms of your evaluations is often things aren't black and white. In fact, they're never black and white. It's never a, it's a false choice between effective or ineffective in terms of absolutes because we also saw that the May Po marshes, there was actually some protection of it, and there were areas that appeared to be still good for, and that, that was in, no doubt in part because of its listing as a Ramsar wetland. So to say is it effective or ineffective, it's more of a, a scale. You might err on the side pretty strongly on the side of it being ineffective, but it's not a, like if it was a scale of zero to 10, with zero being wholly ineffective, and 10 being you know, just totally, absolutely fantastic, complete success, then the Ramsar Convention may be graded at a three or a four. It's more failing than it is succeeding, but it's still not a total failure. And and a key point that I really want to emphasise for you in thinking about effectiveness is don't fall into the trap of it's just a binary choice. And also the fact that something is failing, uh, you know, th this is the reality of what we've got to work with. So it's not a question of just saying, oh, it's all stuffed and walking away. It's, okay, well, we're not succeeding. We're losing a lot of these areas. What more can we do? We've got this international framework that's there. How can we improve its implementation? How can we do things better for our communities so that we ha maintain you know, the prosperity that we all want as, at the same time as maintaining the natural environment that supports us? Because all of these, you know, these wetland areas are not just important for birds, and you know, they're also critical for fisheries uh, and things that you know, people want to eat. So, you know, the fact that you're protecting them as a Ramsar wetland and that makes them a great fish breeding habitat, which then, uh, you know, supports local populations, those are all critical things that, you know, are good reasons to, to protect them. So, it's not black and white. Um, and what you need to do with your um, policy recommendations is think, okay, how do we improve, what are practical things we can do to improve the situation? Another example of a Ramsar wetland that I want to jump to is in Iran. The Faridun Kina Ramsar wetland. So this is an image of it and you can see some cranes there in the foreground. So uh, just focusing in on it, so Iran. If we focus in and come down to the top of Iran. Um, notice the city of Ramsar. Um, so we've got the um, Caspian Sea, it's on the southern um, border of the Caspian Sea and the city of Ramsar was where obviously the Ramsar Convention was signed. To the east of it is the Feridun Kinar wetland. So if we focus in on that, and I'm just going to focus in on where the red circle is. If we come down to the ground, uh, this is what it looks like. And the two birds that you see in the foreground are the Siberian crane. Here's a couple more, or three Siberian cranes. Now, its entry on the Ramsar list. The Firidun Kina wetlands, an artificially maintained wetland in the South Caspian lowlands, comprises four damgas, that is, shallow freshwater impoundments based on rice paddies developed as duck trapping areas surrounded by forest stripped and reed beds and including a wildlife refuge, 48 hectares. Now, how could four shallow freshwater impoundments 
based as rice paddies, how could they possibly be an internationally significant wetland? That might be your question. Does everyone think that that's a fair question? How can four rice paddies be listed on a list of internationally significant wetlands? Well, the answer is in the second part of the listing. The area is of outstanding importance as the wintering ground of the entire western population of the Siberian crane, listed as critically endangered in the IUCN Red Book. Having disappeared at the site in 1978 after 60 years absent, the number of Siberian cranes now fluctuates between 7 and 14. So a little bit about the Siberian crane. Listed on the IUCN Red List as critically endangered, this long-lived crane qualifies as critically endangered owing to fears that its global population will decline extremely rapidly over the next three generations following the development of the Three Gorges Dam in China, which threatens the wintering grounds used by the vast majority of individuals um, a thousand kilometres downstream of the dam site. If the impacts of this development prove to be less damaging um, than is feared, the species may warrant downlisting. But that was an entry in 2010. So the crane distribution in, the, in summer, they're found in the Arctic Russia, in Siberia, and three regional populations are recognised, one of which may be extinct. Uh, the western population winters in Feridun, Kina, um, recently around 10 birds, um, but only one wild bird in the 2006-2007 breeding season. The global population is about 3,750 of which 95% belongs to the eastern population in China. So I just wanted to break out and talk about the IUCN Red List, because it's not, it's, so the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, very famous. Uh, and one of its most famous um, frameworks is the Red List of endangered species. So you can go on to the Red List on the IUCN website, and if you looked up Siberian crane, you'd see that it was listed as critically endangered. So the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species uh, was founded in 1963, so again in this same period. Uh, it's the world's most comprehensive inventory of global conservation status of biological species, and the categories that are recognised go from extinct, which isn't a category you want to be in, um, uh, extinct in the wild, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, um, NT is least concern is least concern. NT, not threatened. not threatened. Okay, and then there's also insufficient there's the insufficient data ones as well, so data deficient. Um, so that's just a um, broad um, categories in them. So critically endangered is obviously not a category that you want to be in. So critically endangered for a species means that a taxon is is when the, the best available evidence indicates that it meets any of the criteria for critically endangered and therefore considered to be facing an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. So uh, here is a picture of Siberian crane. So if that was the Western population, that would be the entire population. So if we were um, the Western population of Siberian cranes in this room, then actually we outnumber them, the entire population. So yeah, they're beautiful birds. So here's just their um, breeding sites. You can see Feridun, Kina. Um, the uh, Indian population, I believe, is uh, thought to be extinct. So the Western population in Feridun, Kina, uh, you see it comes down from um, Europe, and then the Eastern population is, uh, comes down from Siberia and Russia, all the way down to China. So that's just the migration route in China. So I just mentioned also the IUCN a few years ago, well, 2013, created a red list of ecosystems. Uh, so when we, the two major frameworks for conserving biodiversity are um, list of species. So recognise something like the Siberian crane is a species that is endangered and then do measures to protect it. Another way of Another broad mechanism for conserving biodiversity is to protect habitat in areas uh, such as national parks or other protected areas. So cre create marine protected areas or terrestrial protected areas. So you're protecting an entire habitat. And within that, 
threatened species may be, but there's also lots of common species or least threatened species, and you're protecting the entire ecosystem. Because obviously if you, there's pros and cons to both, uh, and the reality is they operate in conjunction. We use threatened species list, we use protected area management uh, as vital tools in conservation, and uh, yeah, but threatened species, if you only protect the species but you clear all its habitat, then obviously that's a problem. Um, the Ramsar Convention is very much about protecting the wetlands, so protecting its habitat so that the species continue to have, be able to come and use it. So um, the red list of ecosystems has everything from not evaluated, data efficient, so least concerned, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, and then collapsed. Just mention a student in a, one of previous courses, and uh, this was a, a lovely um, woman from uh, the Philippines, Karen, and she was a ENVM 7124 student in 2013, and she did a research paper on a uh, on this wetland, and when she went back to the Philippines, she sent me a picture of her standing uh, in front of some signage. I think some of her recommendations were about better public education about the site. So here she's looking really happy, standing in front of um, a sign about the Ramsar wetland, so just focusing in on it. So in the Philippines, we go into Manila, so Manila, Manila Bay, so you can see the obvious development in the eastern part of Manila, Manila Bay and the areas that are obviously being reclaimed um, for ports and industrial development north of it. I'm going to focus in on that red circle. So if we focus in there, you can see obviously a huge amount of development in the coastal area, removing the wetlands, and then these couple of areas of mangroves. Um, obviously there's a lot of artificial um, walls and the like. You don't get straight lines like that um, without um, human intervention. So it's entry on the Ramsar list. Uh, it's a coastal wetland in Manila Bay situated within the metropolis of Manila, comprising two interconnected mangrove colored islands, shallow lagoons and coastline. Um, it was designated as critical habitat in 2007 for the survival of threatened, restricted, and um, congregate, no, I don't even, can't even pronounce that word, congregatory species. I suppose they congregate. At least 5,000 individuals of migratory and resident birds have been recorded on the site, including about 47 migratory species, such as the vulnerable Chinese egret, the most important of the resident, etc. So that wetland is part of um, the East Asian Flyway, which is one of the major flyways for migratory species, obviously coming down from Russia, through China, through the Philippines and Southeast Asia, through Australia, all the way to New Zealand. So there's uh, eight broad flyways for waders and shorebirds gl um, globally, including the East Asia Australasian flyway, which is shown there on the right. So lots of species going through all of these areas. So uh, you can see, the again, the obvious need for international cooperation if we're going to protect those species. You can't break a link along the way that the species needs to stop at or where they're going to. So if the, you remove... 90% of the wetlands, you know, where they go to breed, then you're going to have a massive impact on the population. Okay, there's lots of threats uh, to Ramsar wetlands, not just through coastal development, but obviously rubbish. Uh, pollution is horrific, in, it's horrific here in Brisbane. Uh, in, and it, I'm sure everyone's travelled in, in countries or come from countries where the amount of rubbish in waterways is, is ho just horrible. Uh, and we know, you know the major concerns right now about um, uh, pollution in the oceans, the amount of plastic, the huge um, rubbish patches that are appearing in the Pacific. So an enormous amount of plastic, rope, nets, fishing line, everything. And this um, picture that Karen sent me was of a cleanup of the bay um, done by a conservation group in the area. Okay, so the Ramsar Convention, Article 6, the contracting parties shall, uh, as a necessity arises, convene conferences on the conservation of wetland, wetlands and waterfowl. These conferences shall have an advisory character and shall be competent 
amongst other things, to discuss the implementation of the convention, to discuss additions and changes to the list, to consider information, to make general or specific rec recommendations, etc. So that's the conference of the parties, effectively. They're held every three years. And under them, uh, a lot of the key terms are, have been fleshed out. So in 1999, ecological character and change in ecological character were defined in resolution 7.10. So ecological character was defined as the sum of biological, physical and chemical components of the wetland ecosystem and their interactions which maintain the wetland and its products, functions and attributes. And change in ecological character has got a similar definition. I just wanted to um, point out, in, in terms of interpreting treaty, I really want to emphasise this. So when we interpret treaties under Articles 31 and 30, well, particularly under Articles 31, I emphasised in earlier lectures that you in, the primary rule is that you interpret a treaty in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the treaty, the terms of the treaty in their context and in light of its object and purpose. Okay. That's just looking at the text of the treaty. But look at paragraph 3A in particular. There shall be taken into account, together with the context, any subsequent agreement between the parties regarding the interpretation of the treaty or the application of its provisions. So that's really important to understand because if you just, if you were looking, if you were, say you're working for a government in a few years' time and there's an issue comes up about a Ramsar wetland and you just go and read the, the treaty, you've only got the beginning of the story or the beginning of the interpretation. You also need to look at what have the parties agreed about how the treaty will be interpreted. And you might think, well, that's a massive job. Have I got to go back and look at all of the resolutions since 1971? And the answer is no. All of the major treaties, these complex treaties, prepare handbooks uh, which help bring together all of the current understanding, the current interpretations. So if you wanted to, if you were in that situation and you've got an issue about Ramsar wetlands, you would need to go and look at these handbooks and understand them and their implementation. So on the Ramsar website, there's 20 handbooks. Uh, so everything from, I've just put the covers there, an introduction to the Ramsar Convention wetlands, and then handbook one deals with wise use of wetlands. And I've just got an extract here from that handbook one, wise use of wetlands. Uh, this is from the fourth edition from 2010, which is still the current version uh, on the Ramsar site. And it talks about uh, the definition in paragraph one, definitions of key Ramsar Convention concepts of wise use and ecological character were adopted by COP3 in 1987, COP7 in 1999 respectively. Um, so you get basically a summary of all of the key terms and how they have been changed by the convention of the parties through these handbooks. And I really want to emphasise if you are looking at these conventions, you need to go and look at the website, look at the handbooks and understand how the parties have agreed to implement them and interpret key terms like that. Another thing that's uh, one of the cornerstones of the Ramsar system is to try and establish the baseline. So one of the things that Ramsar requires is that there's a Ramsar information sheet for each wetland which tries to summarise at the time of listing what its ecological character is in terms of, you know, the extent, um, you know, it's the nature of the, the wetland so that, it, and they talk about having a baseline, baseline so that you can then try and measure ecological change from that baseline. So the, the Ramsar information sheets are important. So as I mentioned before, uh, it's not a black and white exercise to talk about effectiveness. So while the Ramsar Convention has provided some important protection for some wetlands, it's not stemmed the rapid loss of wetlands globally. And globally, approximately 35% of mangroves were lost between 1980 and 2000. And some 30% of seagrass have been lost in the last 100 years. For intertidal flats over the last 50 years, losses of up to 51% in coastal wetlands, including marshes, have occurred in China, 40% in Japan, 60% in Korea, Republic of Korea, and more than 70% in Singapore. So the Ramsar 
convention, like all international laws, has to be implemented through national laws and policies to be effective. And the implementation of those laws, you know, broad planning laws, development laws, it's not just the law that, you don't just have to have a law that says, you know, the Ramsar Convention law. In fact, you rarely get that in national laws. What you have are planning laws and other laws that regulate where people can build things, where ports will be developed, where airports will be developed and, that, and the like. And it's those laws and the approvals of you know, major de development under them, which mightn't even refer to Ramsar wetlands or wetlands, it's those laws where the implementation of the Ramsar wetland is, is critical and essentially trying to protect uh, the wetland areas uh, under them. So, yeah, implementation of laws to protect the environment is often complex and difficult. And I just want to give you an example, an, an Australian example. Sometimes environment regulators need to fight. And 10 years ago, there was a fellow called Ronald Greentree, which was ironic. He was the largest wheat grower in New South Wales, private wheat grower. And um, it seems he never saw a tree that he, uh, that he liked. Um, and uh, he bought a property in northern New South Wales, um, which is shown there, and it was part of the Gwadir uh, Ramsar wetland. So it was listed in 1997. It was listed with the consent of the landowner at the time, and then Ronald Greentree and his company bought it in about 2002-2003, no doubt what, knowing that there was a Ramsar listed area on it, uh, decided essentially that the Ramsar listing was something they didn't want, but because it had been agreed by a previous owner, he couldn't just remove it. And the, this area here, uh, in this picture, that was it in 1997. That's the same area in 2003, after Ronald Greentree had bought it. So basically cleared it. And this is a satellite image that was used in a prosecution of him. So this is the image in 2002. And notice the green, the, the Ramsar wetland borders were basically that um, orange, can you see the orange um, polygon? So that, this was a, there was a patchwork of, of areas in this wetland that were listed. So that it, this wasn't the entire wetland, this was just part of it. So that was it in 2002. And that's the same area, you can see the same polygon in 2003. So I'll just go back, notice all this area here, and then it's been cleared in preparation for planting of a wheat crop. So, and this is just some more images of it being cleared. So those were all used in a prosecution of um, Ronald Greentree and his company. And they were prosecuted under the Federal Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act that we have here in Australia, which actually has a provision making it unlawful to take an action that will have a significant impact on the ecological character of a declared Ramsar wetland. So notice that they're picking up the terms from the convention, ecological character, and it's defined to have the same meaning as the Ramsar Convention. So that's direct incorporation of international law into a domestic legal system and making an offence. As I've said in an earlier lecture, a person in clearing a Ramsar wetland like that doesn't commit an offence against the Ramsar Convention because that is a convention that binds the countries, the contracting parties. So it binds Australia, it binds China, it binds the other contracting parties to it. It doesn't bind Ronald Greentree and his company because they're not a party to the convention and it's, has to, it's only when it's incorporated into domestic law in Australia that it potentially becomes an offence. This is an, an example of the convention being incorporated into domestic law. He was prosecuted uh, and yeah, received a substantial fine in order to basically stop um, planting wheat in the area and to rehabilitate it. Here's another example. Yeah, good question. Yeah, great question. Are there checkups? And the simple answer is yes. But the you know, great thing with satellite Im images in terms of environmental regulation, particularly for vegetation clearing and habitat 
damage like this is you don't need to go into the property. You can get, you know, satellite images showing, you know, so there's no, you don't need any authority to get that. It's happening all the time. You just basically access the satellite imagery. So it's relatively easy to check something like that and then monitor it over time as well to see what has changed. So uh, that's the EPBC Act. Uh, this is a current example uh, here in Moreton Bay of a controversial project. So this is a picture of Toondah Harbour in Moreton Bay, or what's proposed to be Toondah Harbour. Has anyone been over to North Strabroke Island? So you catch the ferry from here, this is the ferry terminal, to go to North Strabroke Island. And there's a proposal, and you notice there's um, mangroves and the like around it, uh, and then there's the suburbs <coughs> behind it. And this, sorry, this area of um, mud uh, at low tide, and you see those uh, mangroves there. So this is looking out towards those mangroves. So this is ideal habitat for a lot of uh, migratory wader birds. So they love being able to walk around at low tide, go, you know, looking for little um, mollusks and whatever they want to eat, little worms. So great habitat. And all within the Moreton Bay Ramsar wetland site. So if we look down on it, that's the site now. You can see uh, north of it, the whole area has been developed for a canal estate. Uh, inland, it's all been developed for housing, so a lot of loss of um, wetland and low-lying areas uh, in Brisbane and around, so typical. And what's proposed is that, so I'll just go back. So you can see here this part of the development, that's the existing harbour, and then the proposal, that would be effectively the existing harbour. So it's proposed essentially to reclaim a lot of the area of the existing Ramsar wetland and basically, yeah, build a big, much bigger harbour with residential development and, and the like. So from a developer's perspective, if you can get approval to do something like that, sure, it costs you a bit of money to reclaim it, but it's incredibly valuable in terms of the, the, the development because you've got then, you know, everyone likes to live on the coast, you've got, and essentially you can basically, you just get a lease, you know, if you, if you wanted to buy, for instance, this area with all these houses, you'd be looking at billions of dollars just to, to buy it because it's already been developed. But if you want to build something here, there's no effective property value for it. If you can get a lease to develop it from the government, effectively you get this huge area for basically nothing, and then you've just got to, you know, get the, build it. So the, the it's, coastal development is really attractive to a lot of developers because you take areas that are low value and you turn them into something that's really high value and then you make a huge profit. So that's the proposal. There's been a huge amount of opposition from the community. So that's, um, that's the canal system just, sorry, sorry, just near it. So uh, late last year, there was a whole series of stories about the federal environment minister. So basically the federal environment department said, no way can this go ahead. This is inconsistent with our, we can't, you can't reclaim this huge area of a Ramsar listed wetland when there's already been so much development in Moreton Bay, it should just be refused. And anyway, the federal environment minister intervened and instead of um, it being just knocked back by the department as clearly unacceptable, um, the developer basically managed to get the federal minister to allow it to go through assessment. I actually should have checked if it's what, what, I haven't seen anything in the news whether it's been approved or refused at this stage. I'm assuming it's still undergoing assessment. But there was the whole sort of uh, unsavoury flavour of it with the, the, the developer is a huge donor to the political party that's in power and uh, the, you know, how that influenced the federal environment minister's decision to intervene. So, um, I suppose I wanted to emphasise this is an article that I've been writing for a while and I haven't published it yet, but I, I wanted to just share you, with you my thoughts. I think the reality that emerges in implementing environmental law 
including things like the Ramsar Convention, can best be summarised as environmental law is hard, it should be rather than in, is, is hard and money talks. Environmental law is inherently hard to implement because of the complex reality of environmental issues such as major groundwater impacts and climate change. Money talks not in direct corrupt payments but in the culture of regulatory capture and decision making implementing environmental laws in which jobs and money are routinely given preeminence over environmental damage. And money talks in the reality that large aggressive companies can cower governments uh, into lack of regulation and out-resource ordinary people and conservation groups who are fighting them in litigation. At the moment I'm involved in a whole a number of court cases about a big mine out west of uh, Queensland. Uh, it's billions of dollars worth of coal. It's a very aggressive company and uh, yeah, they've built this because of delays in their approval, they just started mining this pit and there's this pit that's 1.5 kilometres across by a kilometre north to south that doesn't actually have any approvals. It's this 80 metres deep. It is this enormous uh, hole in the ground, billion, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth of coal and effectively they've been allowed to do it um, through pretty well because they're so big and aggressive. So it's hard is really hard implementing these things. The amount of money that gets thrown at you, uh, if you're, say, working in an environment, not thrown at you, I should rephrase that. If you are working, you know, to try and implement the Ramsar Convention and improve planning, say you're in local government or in a state environment department, when big developments like this come along, there is so much political pressure to approve them. So much political pressure. And it is really hard to stand in the way of that, you know, tidal wave of pressure and say, well, no, we can't approve this because of the Ramsar Convention, because of, you know, this is bad planning. Those things are really hard to do in reality. Let's leave the Ramsar Convention and move on to the World Heritage Convention. But I noticed we've been talking for an hour, so uh, shall we take a break, get up, have a cup of coffee? Uh, coffee here, you can go up and get a cup of tea. So why don't we take, say, 10 minutes? and come back and we'll talk about the, go on to the next exciting convention, the World Heritage Convention, which probably the most famous international convention everyone knows and loves. Welcome back to Start that again. <laughs> Welcome back to our lecture. We, before the break, we were talking about the Ramsar Convention. We're going to move on now to look at perhaps the most famous international environmental treaty, the World Heritage Convention. So the full title is the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage, signed in 1972. So in summary, the World Heritage Convention has 193 parties. So 167 have properties on the World Heritage list. So in the context where there's 193 members of the UN, this is a convention that basically has 100% of the countries of the world have signed up to it. And I want to think about why that is the case uh, as we look at its provisions. So there's 193 parties, 1,121 properties listed as World Heritage. That includes 869 cultural, 213 natural, and 39 mixed cultural and natural as at yesterday. And it's got a great website. Uh, on the UNE World Heritage Convention, unesco.org. You can go onto that website. It's got a great interactive map. You can just, you know, zoom in on the country of interest and then click on little bubbles and we'll tell you about the different properties. Now, a catalyst for the World Heritage Convention was a decision by the Egyptian government in the 1950s to build the Aswan High Dam, which would have flooded the valley containing the Abu Simbel temples, a treasure of ancient... Uh, Egyptian civilization. So that was a catalyst. Essentially, the world community, the Egyptian government wanted to build the dam, and uh, 
sought assistance to save these temples that were an area that would be flooded. And the global community, led by the US, basically raised money to move the temples. And in doing so, they recognised that there was a need to establish a, a broader framework to provide assistance to countries to protect uh, properties that were of outstanding universal significance to humanity. I just want to give you some snapshots of world heritage around the world. So we're going to look at the Abu Simbel temples, the pyramids of Giza, the Great Wall of China and a few others. So let's start with the Abu Simbel temple. So you can see Egypt there and I've just put an arrow where the Abu Simbel temple was. This is a um, photograph of it and basically what happened was in 1959 after an appeal from the governments of Egypt and Sudan, UNESCO launched an international safeguarding campaign and the Abu Simbel and the Philae temples were entirely dismantled, moved to dry ground and reassembled. And I just want to play you a little film clip from then. Again, it's uh, a bit dated, but it captures the sort of the, the essence of what was going on and how amazing it was. And it's from the World Heritage website. Going to get that into full. Under his reign during the 13th century BC, he built the temple to show the might of his kingdom to the Nubian people. He'd had difficulty in putting them under Egyptian control. The temple faced the threat of being submerged during the construction of the Aswan Dam in the 1960s. There was an outcry worldwide against the plan, and steps were taken to save the site from submersion. This resulted in a large-scale project involving 50 countries, led by UNESCO, to relocate the entire temple. It was cut into 16,000 blocks for relocation. No explosives were used. The relocation project was successfully completed in 1968. Its success led to the eventual adoption of the World Heritage Convention four years later. moved, its direction and position in relation to the sun was maintained. The temple is 63 meters deep and dark inside. There are statues of ancient Egyptian gods along with the statue of Ramesses II in the innermost part of the temple. The king had deified himself. Another ancient monument which had been submerged under the dam was also saved four years after the Abu Simbel relocation. It was a temple of Isis. The temple used to stand on a small island known as the Pearl of the Nile. It was relocated to another similar island. The temple was built during the 4th century BC. Isis was believed to be a goddess of eternal life and resurrection. There is a carving of Isis breastfeeding her child on the wall of the inner temple. Abu Simbel has the same angle it had in ancient times. The same phenomenon occurs at dawn on every spring and autumn equinox day. At 6.29 a.m., the first rays of sunlight stream through the temple to cast light on the statue of Ramesses II. The rising sun is a symbol of resurrection. The temple has been brought back to life. The statue of Ramesses II shines on. So, I don't know about you, I just find that completely amazing. The idea of taking the entire temple, cutting it into blocks, 16,000 of them, moving them, reassembling it, just seems absolutely crazy. 
And yeah, next time you're doing a jigsaw puzzle and you're having a hard time, just think about the poor people moving this in 3D, so a 3D jigsaw puzzle that you've got to put back together. So that's the Abu Simbel temples. And as I said, it was the catalyst for the entire convention. And looking at another World Heritage Site, the Pyramids of um, Giza, very famous. Everyone knows these sorts of pictures. So when we think about these, uh, an image like this though, and the essence of World Heritage is that we're listing and recognising something that is of outstanding universal value to humanity. So it goes beyond just something that the nation, it's significant to the nation, but that it's internationally significant. So here, um, one of the pyramids with the Great Sphinx in the foreground. So another World Heritage uh, site is the Great Wall of China, which was actually, there's a whole, there was a whole series of Great Walls of China built uh, at different um, periods. This is uh, part of the Great Wall, uh, just stretching along that mountaintop, just an amazing, amazing construction. And this is a section near Beijing. Has anyone been to the Great Wall of China? Number? looks fantastic. And, and another section of the Great Wall near Beijing. So those are sites. That, so there's the two broad categories, natural heritage and cultural heritage. So all of those are cultural heritage. Some of the natural heritage that are listed, this is um, another uh, World Heritage Site in China and it was the inspiration for the Hallelujah Mountains in Avatar. So has everyone seen Avatar? That a movie with um, yeah green people with t uh, not green blue people with tails, uh, and you know there's a great section where they go to learn to fly the birds, and they have to climb up through the mountains that are floating in the sky. So the the Hallelujah Mountains in the movie were inspired by this amazing national um, forest park uh, in China, which I just look at as a rock climber and go. Gosh, that just looks amazing. Has anyone been to that park as well? Wow, you guys are so lucky. Yeah, it looks amazing. Okay, another World Heritage Site is Ha Long Bay in Vietnam. So in northern Vietnam, close to China. So really, really beautiful area. I know a number of people already said you've been to Ha Long Bay. So... Uh, another site, this one a cultural site, Machu Picchu. Has anyone been to Machu Picchu? Whoa! Uh, so, uh, amazing site built on mountaintop uh, in Peru. So that's the location of Machu Picchu. And yeah, just a couple of images that again I've just gotten from Google Earth. And yeah, just look down at that, you know, the, the terraces how incredibly, you know, the incredible construction of this site. It's amazing what you can do with a few thousand slaves. And yeah, just another image of some tourists at Machu Picchu. Okay, coming to Australia, uh, Queensland has five World Heritage Areas. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef that everyone knows, the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area in North Queensland, Fraser Island, uh, close, relatively close to here. Uh, in Southeast Queensland, we've got the Gondwana Rainforest of Australia World Heritage Area, which we're visiting tomorrow for the field trip. Uh, up in the northwest of Queensland is the Australian Fossil Mammal Sites, Riversley. There's also, it's one of two sites, there's one in South Australia as well. So they're the five World Heritage Sites in Queensland. So the Great Barrier Reef, uh, everyone knows, but an incredible uh, ecosystem, a chain of thousands of coral reefs barrier reef stretching much of the length of the Queensland coast with incredible biodiversity and incredible beauty. One of the first sites listed uh, under the World Heritage Convention. 
And it's not just beautiful reefs, but it's also got beautiful islands. So Whitsunday Island, so area where I'm from in the Whitsundays. Whitsunday Island, incredibly beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so Springbrook uh, in the Gondwana Rainforest of Australia World Heritage Area is where we're visiting tomorrow for the field trip. So this is the view when we get out of the bus and look out uh, over the World Heritage Area. This is a snake that was on one of the just beside the track um, on one of the field trips a few years ago, completely harmless uh, uh, carpet python. But yeah, just curled up underneath one of the little dry area underneath one of the waterfalls. And uh, sometimes we go on different walks. I'm not sure what we'll do tomorrow. I'm thinking about which, is, which will be the most fun walk, whether we just go down and have a swim. Uh, sometimes we've gone down, last year we went the full worry circuit, which goes down to this uh, meeting of, called the Meeting of the Waters, this lovely walk, uh, and yeah, you're in the midst of the rainforest. And the Gondwana Rainforest of Australia is actually a mosaic of um, a number of, I think, yeah, a number of um, properties through northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland. So essentially, they're the remnants of the rainforest areas uh, in the region. And they've been joined together to make, in terms of the one listing, and generally they're in national parks. So Springbrook is shown there in the red circle, and then Lamington is off to the west of it. So if we look at the convention in that context, so that's some of the sites, amazing, beautiful, huge cultural significance, it's obvious. So the World Heritage Convention, if we look at it, uh, starts with a standard preamble. So the UNESCO, uh, meeting in 1972, um, noting that the cultural heritage and natural heritage are increasingly threatened with destruction not only by the traditional causes of decay, but also by changing social and economic conditions, which aggravate the situation with even more formid formidable phenomena of damage or destruction. Considering that the deterioration or disappearance of any item of the cultural or natural heritage constitutes a harmful impurity impoverishment sorry, of the heritage of all the nations of the world, considering that the protection of this heritage at the national level often remains incomplete because of the scale of the resources which it requires and of the insufficient economic, scientific and technological resources of the country where the property um, to be protected is situated and then goes on from there. So as I said in earlier lectures, this is a standard preamble setting the the, setting out the problem, why countries have come together to, uh, to reach this agreement. So this is the context. Then it begins with some definitions. So Article 1, for the purposes of this convention, the following shall be considered cultural heritage, monuments, groups of buildings, sites. And can you find in that a common term that's used? So monuments, architectural works, works of monumental sculpture and painting, elements or structures of an architect, archae archaeological nature, inscription, cave dwellings, and combinations of features which are of outstanding universal value from the point of view of history, art, or science, and groups of buildings, groups of separate or connected buildings which, because of their architecture, um, etc., are of outstanding universal value from the point of history, art, or science, and sites, etc., which are of outstanding universal value. What's the common term that keeps cropping up, outstanding universal value, is the common denominator. And similarly for natural heritage, the definition in Article 2, natural features consisting of physical and biological formations or groups of such formations which are of outstanding universal value from the aesthetic or scientific point of view, etc. So outstanding universal value is the core idea around which world heritage is built. Article 4 then states one of the primary obligations. Each state party to this convention recognises that the duty of ensuring the identification, protection, conservation, presentation and transmission to future generations of the cultural and natural heritage referred to in Articles 1 and 2 and situated on its territory belongs primarily to that state. It will do all that it can to this end to the utmost of its own resources and where appropriate with any international assistance and cooperation 
in particular financial, aesthetic, scientific and technical, uh, which it may be able to obtain. So I'm going to emphasise one of the core reasons why this convention is so popular is evident there. Who is responsible for identification, protection, etc.? The state. It's not assigning it to some international body, it's the primary duty stays with the state to identify and protect. So a country in signing up and ratifying the World Heritage Convention isn't just giving up the identification protection of all of you know these amazing sites that might be within its territory to some overseas body. It's still in the driving seat. Article 8, an intergovernmental committee for the protection of the cultural and natural heritage of outstanding universal value called the World Heritage Committee is hereby established within UNESCO. It sh shall be comprised of 15 states to the convention elected by the state parties to the convention meeting in general assembly during the ordinary session of the general conference of UNESCO. The number of states shall be increased to 21 from the date of the ordinary session, etc. So the World Heritage Committee is established. So think of it, there's 193 parties. And what this treaty does is create a subgroup of them and calls them the World Heritage Committee. And they are essentially primarily responsible for listing and the like. So it's a subgroup of the parties and they rotate through. It was increased from 15 to 21 a few years ago in large, one of the main reasons was to en enable a lot of more, a lot of countries to participate. So here's a picture of the World Heritage Committee meeting. It meets once a year. Uh, it's got 21 state parties uh, elected by the General Assembly, so all of the states. So that was a meeting in Russia, the 36th World Heritage Committee meeting in St. Petersburg. Okay, Article 11. Each state party of this convention shall, insofar as possible, submit to the World Heritage Committee an inventory of property forming part of the cultural and natural heritage situated in its territory and suitable for inclusion in the list provided for in paragraph two of this article. This inventory, which shall be not considered exhaustive, shall include documentation about the location of the property in question and its significance. So again, who's in charge? the state party. It doesn't say the World Heritage Committee. You submit it to the World Heritage Committee, but the World Heritage Committee doesn't go out and do the searching. Like it doesn't come into, say, China or Australia and say, hey, this area over here, uh, that should be on the list. The state is the one that's responsible for listing it. Now, just think about these sites as well. And let's just think about the... So we know that states are often really reluctant to give up their sovereignty, give up control of their own territory. They don't like being told what to do with their own territory by other countries. No country likes that. So think about the conflic conflicting reasons, policy reasons why a state signs up to this. Why do you think a state would sign up to the World Heritage Committee and, you know, because you're and, and recognise some of these properties. What's the primary driver? Tourism. Tourism, absolutely. World Heritage Sites are great tourist generators. Having something recognised as outstanding universal value is a tremendous draw card. So it's a great reason to list it. But also think about it, let's just think about China and the Great Wall of China. Uh, so that's been listed. But just imagine the World Heritage Convention didn't exist. Would China want to protect the Great Wall of China anyway? Like, is China proud of its cultural heritage? Obviously, yes. Obviously, China wants to protect the Great Wall of China. And it's this incredible uh, architecture that was made centuries ago that um, is an important part of Chinese culture. If the World Heritage Convention didn't exist, there would be no doubt national protections of this site. So 
in signing up and then nominating, let's just say, so there's already strong protections at a national level of this site because the country's really proud of it. It's this great achievement and really important to its culture. And it signs up to this convention and it nominates the Great Wall of China, but the whole area is already fully protected. In nominating the Great Wall of China then and having it on the list, what do you lose? Like from China's perspective, what have you, have you constrained any development that would have otherwise occurred? Probably not. Because you weren't going to allow it anyway because you wanted to protect this site. Similarly like the, the pyramids of Egypt for instance, like the Egyptian government would have wanted to protect them anyway. They weren't going to pull them, you know, knock them down. So by listing them, it's not like they've given up a develop, you know, the ability to develop something. So often sites that are listed on the World Heritage List, a country really hasn't given up very much and it's gained a lot in terms of national pride and international pride, you know, having, you know, six or ten or I think Australia's got 40 World Heritage Sites listed. China would have many, you know, many countries have a lot of sites listed. You know, that's a great point of pride. And a lot of these sites would have been highly protected anyway under your own national systems. So you can see why this treaty is actually really popular from countries because you gain international recognition and often you're not giving up a lot. Okay, uh, Article 11, Paragraph 2. On the basis of the inventory submitted by the states in accordance with Paragraph 1, the committee shall establish, keep up to date and publish under the title of World Heritage List, a list of properties forming part of the cultural heritage and natural heritage as defined in Articles 1 and 2, which it considers having outstanding universal value in terms of such criteria as it shall have established. An updated list shall be distributed every two years. So countries submit it and then the World Heritage Committee decides whether it goes on the list or not. And then the inclusion of the property on the list um, requires the consent of the state concerned, the inclusion of a property situated in a territory, sovereignty or jurisdiction over which um, was claimed by more than one state shall in no way prejudice the rights of the parties to the dispute. So again, uh, the primary driver remains the state. The, they haven't given up, you know, they re it requires consent to list, so signing up to this convention, does you don't lose control of your own territory. Okay, so virtually every country in the world is party to the World Heritage Convention. Why? I think we've already answered that. It's because it's a great tourist draw card, it's a great point of national pride. Often the properties are already highly protected under your national planning and heritage systems. So protecting these sites isn't something that's just constraining what you would have done otherwise. Okay, Article 11 also established, so there's two lists under the World Heritage Convention. There's the World Heritage List, but within that there's also a subset called the List of World Heritage in Danger. So the committee, so this is paragraph four of Article 11, the committee shall establish, keep up to date and publish uh, a list of World Heritage in Danger, which is a list of property appearing on the World Heritage List um, for which major operations are necessary and for which assistance has been requested under this convention, and etc. And they, c they can be endangered through natural things like fires or earthquakes, or they might be, you know, human caused things like war. So the list of World Heritage in Danger you don't want to be on, but it was established because one of the big things that the World Heritage Convention tried to do was provide funding to countries to help them protect their world heritage. So, you know, for a poor country, for instance, uh, can potentially gain funding to assist in the management of a site. So Article 11 also says in paragraph five, the committee shall define the criteria on the basis of which a property belonging to the cultural or natural heritage may be included. Now, again, I've, I've said often conventions are frameworks. They set up the broad parameters and then details are worked out later and that's the same under the World Heritage Convention. So in accordance with Article 11, Paragraph 5, the World Heritage Committee has published operational guidelines. So the latest version is from July of this year. And I looked at them in the previous versions and they, they don't, you know, they haven't changed hugely. So it's similar to the version that's been around for the last decade. And in Paragraph 49, it 
talks about the outstanding universal value um, and defines the criteria. So in paragraph 77, the committee considers a property as having outstanding universal value if the property meets one or more of the following criteria. Nominated properties shall therefore, one, represent a masterpiece of human creative genius, two, exhibit an important interchange of human values over a span of time or within a cultural area of the world, etc. Um, so think of something like the pyramids of Giza in Egypt as being um, you know, of outstanding universal value, meeting those criteria. Again, if you just went and looked at the convention and didn't have these criteria in mind, you'd be missing a big part of how the convention operates. So in interpreting the convention, you need to be aware of the operational guidelines, so the subsidiary documents. And it, the list goes on, the criteria, um, so in terms of, um, sorry, this, I should just go back. So 77, outstanding universal value, the first um, five are really about the cultural heritage. Uh, then the remainder are more about um, natural heritage. So you've got their um, seven contain superlative natural phenomena or areas of exceptional natural beauty and aesthetic importance. So the Great Barrier Reef, for instance. Um, major stages in the Earth's history, uh, examples representing significant ongoing ecological and biological processes and contain the most important and significant natural habitats for in situ, which means in the wild. Conservation of biological diversity. Again, Great Barrier Reef is a great example of all of those criteria. So, Importantly, the, at the operational guidelines say that a property also must have conditions of, meet conditions of integrity and have adequate protection and management to ensure it's safeguarding. So if a country nominates a property, it also has to show how it's protecting that property. So for, say, Australia and the Great Barrier Reef, it's protected under its own bit of legislation, there's a management plan in place for it, there's a whole range of protections for it. Similarly with Springbrook that we're going to visit tomorrow, it's part of a national park and it was a it's been a national park and Lamington's been a national park since about, I think the, about 1910 or something. Like they were listed a century ago as part of a big push that came from the US for listing national parks. Australia copied that, that idea from the US. And so these areas were already protected as national parks, so they met the conditions for protection and management, and also Australia in nominating them wasn't giving up much because it was already full, they were already fully protected from development under national laws, so nominating them for World Heritage status just basically gives them recognition, doesn't actually constrain development. However, there's a, been a hook in the tail. Until recently, it was virtually all left to the states to work out. But recently, Australia got caught out. Uh, there was, uh, under the operational guidelines in paragraph 172, it requires states to inform the committee if there's going to be any development that might, that might affect the outstanding universal value of a property and basically tell the committee about that. And most countries were ignoring it. Australia was ignoring it until uh, there was a lot of, there was a big push to develop a lot of coal ports uh, back in the early 2010-2011, there was a real massive expansion of the, the coal industry and um, calcium gas industry uh, in Queensland and there was a push for all of these port expansions and some conservation groups alerted UNESCO to it and UNESCO basically asked Australia if, if it could send an investigative team out to have a look at it. So Australia, of course, said yes, because Australia is one of the being one of the at the forefronts of world heritage. We, you know, we're really strong on it because of its uh, important tourism values, and you know, we're a big proponent of it. So as the reactive monitoring report was written. Uh, sorry, um, two members, one from UNESCO and one from IUCN, came out and they wrote this report, which is just amazing at the time. It was about uh, this development in. Um, Gladstone, Curtis Island, a lot of develop development was going on. And basically the um, report 
strongly criticised Australia and said basically the unplanned and rapid development of these ports was endangering the outstanding universal value. And it led the Australian and Queensland governments to doing backflips for about five years, basically to improve the management of the Great Barrier Reef and also to regulate port development. It also happened that within a couple of years, the whole boom around the expansion of the coal sector died. So it wasn't just, it, it didn't just lead to improved planning in Australia. It, it was also coincided with a sort of the pressure falling back. But um, Australia has basically been, and there's still ongoing work, to show to the uh, World Heritage Committee why the Great Barrier Reef should not be entered on the list of World Heritage in Danger. Because that would be, if it was, the Great Barrier Reef was listed on the list of World Heritage in Danger, what do you think that would be in terms of the politics within Australia? Because the GBR is the iconic natural ecosystem in Australia. Australians are very proud of it, love it. If it's listed on, if it's entered on the list of World Heritage in Danger, yeah, it would be extremely embarrassing for the Australian government and the Queensland governments. So, um, yeah, so it's been a, it, it was an example of the World Heritage Committee actually getting involved and not just leaving it up to the state to do their own thing. Uh, I, I found it amazing at the time. Uh, so it's, there's, it's not just a free ride, uh, the World Heritage Convention. There are actually obligations under it and, it and it can put some hooks into what you can do within uh, a country. But that's the, I'd say that's the exception more than the rule. Okay, just an example of protecting world heritage uh, in Australia, and I mention it because it's the most famous environmental dispute in Australia. It was about uh, stopping a big dam in Tasmania uh, in 1983, and the dam would have flooded an area that was um, within a world heritage property. Uh, and this was an iconic picture or is it an iconic picture that was used in the advertising by the Wilderness Society in campaigning against this dam. It would have flooded this gorge. This is called Rock Island Bend. This is a picture taken by Peter Drombromsky. And the dam, proposed dam, was on the west coast of Tasmania. Uh, here's some images. I went to the High Court and got some images of uh, related to the litigation, and there's a case study of it on my website. But essentially, the river is, was flowing down to the west coast, and it was the Gordon River, and the dam was to be built just beneath the junction between the Franklin River and the Gordon River, which then fl flows out to the west coast, and Rock Island Bend is located up here on the Franklin River. So it would have flooded a very large section of the Franklin and Gordon Rivers. Upstream on the Gordon River in the 19... 70s or 1969 to 1974 there would have been a dam built called the um, Gordon River Dam, this sort of classic high dam, which flooded some uh, really beautiful areas and is often seen as the, um, the genesis of the modern Australian environment movement, the campaign to stop the flooding of Lake Pedder, um, which failed. But essentially it primed the situation for when this dam was proposed downstream, there was already a strong groundswell of the, in, in the conservation sector about stopping um, further development. So it led to this massive uh, series of civil protests. This is from 1983, dam protesters. And uh, it led to the opposition party at a federal level was led by a fellow called Bob Hawke at the time. And he promised if he was elected that he would stop the damming of the Franklin River, even though the state government wanted to build it. He won that election and then it went to court and the High Court of Australia decided that the, our federal government could make laws to implement, under our constitutional system, our federal government could make laws to implement Australia's international treaty obligations under the World Heritage Convention. So it was an absolute milestone in Australian constitutional law, something that all Australian environmental law students learn about um, because it fundamentally changed the relationship between our national government and our state governments. So under the Commonwealth Constitution, there's no sp real specific references to protecting the environment, but our Commonwealth government has 
power to make laws with respect to a, a number of heads of power, including things like trade and commerce, tax, quarantine, fisheries, corporations, but then external affairs, 5129 was the big one. So there was a power to make laws with respect to external affairs, and the High Court held that that extended to making laws that were reasonably and appropriately adapted to fulfil Australia's international legal obligations. So, and under our constitutional system, a valid federal law overrides state laws to the extent of inconsistency. So, yeah, it was a massive victory for the Commonwealth Government, but also, yeah, an environmental dispute in Australia. There's ongoing uh, disputes about world heritage um, in Australia. So, in um, the early two th about 2012, uh, the Australian government of the time, the Labor government, expanded some of the world heritage uh, sites in southwest Tasmania. And then, when the next government, which was a different party, the uh, under um, Tony Abbott, was the prime minister, was elected, he tried to to remove the areas that had been delisted, basically to change the boundaries back. And the World Heritage Committee just said, no way. We just recognise this as having outstanding universal value. We're not going to delist it. So once it was listed, the World Heritage Committee refused to delist it. So, OK, so that's World Heritage, absolute cornerstone of the international environmental uh, regulatory system. And tomorrow, uh, we get to vi visit a World Heritage Site. Let's um, move on. And I just want to mention the Stockholm Conference and then a couple of other treaties, just briefly, to wrap up this lecture. So the Stockholm Conference was in 1972. It was held in Stockholm, obviously, in Sweden. Uh, and it was um, the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment uh, it was held yeah, in 1972. It was attended by representatives of 113 countries and a large number of non-government organisations and it's widely recognised as the beginning of the modern political and public awareness of global environmental problems. So that's the Stockholm Conference in 1972. I won't go into the declarations that came from or the like, just it was an important milestone. And yeah. I said I wouldn't go into it, but I'll just mention a couple. The Stockholm Declaration contained 21 principles concerning the environment and development. For example, principle one, the sexist language of the time will change to human, humans. Sorry, humanity has the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being, and um, they bear a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. Okay, so that's the Stockholm Declaration. Also at that time, again, I'll just mention another uh, important treaty. Important in the sense that you know, there was nothing like this before. And so when it was created, it, it created a framework that, did, that really revolutionised um, the international regulatory system. So the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna, and we talked about GATT in an earlier lecture. Uh, this is also related to trade, but specific to international trade in endangered species. So long, clumbersome title. Most people just know it as CITES by the acronym. So uh, again, it starts with the preamble, recognising that basically trade threatens um, species, and then um, goes on to some obligations. It's also very widely subscribed globally, so there's 183 parties to CITES. So all those countries shown in green are parties to CITES, including the US, Canada, China, all of South America, Russia, uh, India, Australia. So Again, it starts with some definitions for species, specimen, etc. I won't dwell on those, but you know, you're just getting the idea that there's this common sort of framework that these conventions have. Um, I just mentioned one thing that specimen includes um, things whether they're alive or dead. So something like ivory from a elephant tusks. Obviously, the if the elephant has been killed to get it, it's only part of the elephant. Uh, and it's dead, but it can still be regulated. 
So the fundamental principles of it are basically it's linked to annexes. So annex appendix one, um, sorry, appendix one shall include all species threatened with extinction which are or may be affected by trade and, and appendix two shall include a range of other things, so appendix three. So if you look at those ap appendixes and this is just a screen grab from the CITES website. So appendix one, appendix two, appendix three, um, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, species. You can see there's uh, in appendix one there's a thousand species, in appendix two there's 34,000 and then appendix three there's three. So they've got different levels of protection and elephants, I just used as an example, so uh, obviously um, ivory um, is widely traded, used for some medicines, used in some ornamental things, you know, carving little piano keys and, you know, um, range of things. So uh, typically you kill the elephant to get the ivory, so it's a source of mortality for a lot of elephants. Here's just a horrible picture of some tusks that have been taken from an elephant. Um, here's some of the ivory and things that it's turned into, little sculptures. And uh, yeah, there's huge threats to the elephant populations basically due to ivory trade. So um, the distribution of African elephants is quite constrained now. In, you know, in some areas they've, they're still doing okay, but yeah, threats from poaching is a major problem for them. This is just a story from a few years ago about African elephants reduced to dire levels. I won't play the clip. Um, but yeah, um, elephants are listed under CITES um, in an, uh, appendix, the different species are listed in different, the different um, appendixes. And yeah, this is an article from again a few years ago just talking about illegal killing for ivory drives global decline in African elephants. Illegal harvest for commercial trade has recently surged to become a major threat to some of the world's most endangered and charismatic species. Unfortunately, the cryptic nature of illegal killing makes estimation of rates and impacts difficult. So that's what the article was about. So again, I just want to pause on that. So this is an article from 2014. Societies has been in place for decades and we're still seeing decline in the, in the species. So if we're looking at it and saying, well, is CITES um, effective? or not, what do you think? Is it effective? If elephants are still declining, is it being effective? Again, it's a trick question because it's not a black and white. And also the, the question that you'd want to also ask is, well, how can you improve the system? You know, like CITES is about trying to con control it. And if you're trying to deal with something like uh, illegal poaching, then by its very nature, it's not People are doing it illegally. So a legal system like CITES is going to struggle, you know, ju just as with criminal law, the fact that um, murders still occur doesn't mean that the criminal law is, is ineffective. Um, yes, murders still occur or thefts still occur, but if you didn't have the, the criminal justice system, would it be worse? Highly likely the answer to that is yes. Similarly with CITES, it's not fully effective by any means, but it's a system that at least makes a substantial contribution and tries to regulate and protect those species. And the question is not really whether it's effective or ineffective, but how can you improve it? How can you make it more effective in the real world where it's incredibly difficult to regulate poaching? You know, they typically occur in remote areas um, and yeah, people get killed trying to stop poachers. So you know they come in heavily armed at night. Really difficult. So uh, I won't dwell on that. I think the point is made. Dangers, the the, the problems of dealing with it. What CITES is about. Um, one other convention from this sort of period that I wanted to mention is about the con sorry the conservation of migratory species of wild animals commonly called the Bonn Convention, signed in the German city of Bonn, signed in 1979. Again, another important convention about migratory species. So can you see also there's a lot of overlap with many of, this, many of the conventions. So the Ramsar Convention was about protecting international migratory birds. Uh, the Bonn Convention also covers birds. And uh, 
you know, t something like turtles occur within, say, World Heritage Sites like the Great Barrier Reef. So if you're protecting species in the Great Barrier Reef, you're also protecting migratory species. So you can see there's overlap between all of these um, frameworks. So there's 130 parties to the Bonn Convention, uh, which is relatively lim limited compared with Ramsar and the World Heritage Convention and CITES. The fundamental principles are essentially to um, protect and manage endangered migratory species. Again, there's appendixes that are listed, um, you know, listing what species are protected and things like turtles uh, are listed under the um, appendixes of the Bond Convention. Again, I don't want to dwell on it, I just mention it in passing. Okay, tomorrow we're going to go to Gondwana, Rainforest Reserve at Springbrook, so part of the, um, yeah, World Heritage Site in southwest, south, south east Queensland. Um, we leave from the lakes bus stop at eight o'clock, so if you're coming along, uh, come down to the, bay, the um, bus stop by eight. We'll head off, uh, head down the freeway. Uh, we'll have a talk about which, there's a whole heap of really great walks uh, there, uh, and we'll, we'll make a choice on what we want to do, and depending on what the day is like. Uh, there's some really great swimming holes, so if you want to bring some swimmers, um, we'll try and find a place that's, uh, we'll, we'll go to one of the great swimming holes, but it's a really beautiful site, listed for its uh, scenic beauty, but also for its amazing biodiversity. And yeah, if you're coming, bring some good shoes, hat, sunscreen. Rain gear probably isn't necessary for tomorrow, although yeah, in previous years we've gone there and it's poured with rain and we've huddled under a cave and um, it's been fun, but uh, yeah, we all get back into the bus um, soaking wet. Uh, so rain gear, um, water and food for the day, so there's no restaurants that we pass on the, on the way, so um, bring your lunch, um, sensible clothes for the field, bring a camera, uh, yeah, swim costume. And yeah, we'll have a field trip competition. So there'll be two categories for the best picture and best series of pictures. Chocolate prize is awarded later in the week. So yeah, bring along your camera. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, we've looked at these groundbreaking treaties that were uh, agreed in the early 1970s, the Ramsar Convention, the World Heritage Convention, and CITES. Uh, they're absolute cornerstones of the modern system and yeah, they were groundbreaking at the time. In summary, can I just say this? Groundbreaking environmental treaties were signed in the early 1970s. They provide the cornerstone of the modern international environmental system. Later agreements and technical manuals agreed by the parties can be important in interpreting treaties. And the examples of that, the Ramsar and World Heritage Conventions um, that I've highlighted, you've really got to go and look at those handbooks and operational guidelines if you're looking at those treaties. And also, a key point is international law does not protect the environment without effective implementation international laws. And that's very much what you're looking at in your research papers. Okay, if you are interested in these conventions, go and have a look at their websites, they're really fantastic. You could go to tech sites, textbooks, but this is a really good example of why I don't prescribe a textbook because there's just so much information on the websites, so much more interesting to go and look at the real documents. The, the conventions themselves are relatively easy to understand. The difficulty is in the implementation. That's when it's hard. That's, and yeah, that's the end of the lecture. So um, it's right on 11 o'clock. Um, next up, we've got the um, marine collection. It's, there's a short lecture, basically. Um, and what I w would like to do is basically take a 10 minute break now, come back, and then we'll just do the Marpole lecture, which goes for about an hour. And then we might break early for lunch and come back early. And then uh, after lunch, we're going to go into one of the most amazing conventions that we'll cover, or one of the most important from a practical everyday level, which is UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, absolutely cornerstone for uh, the international um, system in 
giving maritime zones to countries. So any country that's got a coastline wants to be a party to UNCLOS because then it can control fishing and oil and gas development out to 200 nautical miles. So it's really important. So we'll spend the rest of the afternoon on that. And then uh, we've got a little workshop on making good policy recommendations to finish off the day. Does that sound good? Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break now. Get up, stretch your legs, uh, eat some of the um, palm oil free popcorn or the like, or go and make yourself a coffee and come back and we'll uh, have a look at Marpol.